So we're back here. Uh, it's the spot. It's a uh, uh, village square. It's a uh, newspaper stand. It's a uh, barber shop. It's that place where we vibe about uh, all things uh, important and um, and salient with as little filter as possible. Uh, today we have someone with us that I mean we just we just this this is our lucky day. So this is like. This is like Christmas in October, right? Christmas pops in October and Santa says, make a wish. And you make a wish and you say, you know, this is the first thing that you'd like to have a yeah, child with today. <laughs> and bang, you know, Santa says, you have it. And the clouds open and he just drops on the platter. We have someone who is an amazing human being. That's probably all I'm going to say, an amazing human being. Uh, if, if this were a multiverse, if this were a multiverse, uh, it, it would be, uh, you know, he would be me, but that, that would mean that I'll, I'll be a, a, a lot more uh, knowledgeable. It would mean I'm, I'll be a lot more uh, uh, articulate. It would mean that I'll be a lot more uh, uh, powerful. But so, so, so this is probably the character I probably would be in, you know, in a multiverse if, if I could just snap my finger and make it happen. We have the, the one... particular or the multiverse? <laughs> no, the, Nigeria is not there. No, Nigeria is not the multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have the one, the only Olakunle Shorinyon, a.k.a. PK. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so you're welcome. Uh, PK is a futurist. Um, let's start from there. Yeah. You know, uh, what in God's green earth, on God's green earth is futurism? Who is a futurist? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here. I feel so excited, you know. I don't get used to these things. I've been doing interviews and speaking a lot of that for close to over two decades, actually. Just working behind the scene um, on many levels with so many people. Um, but I don't get used to it. I feel privileged every time. And even right now, I feel so much privilege and gratitude. Thank you for allowing me to share my voice and to multiply you know, my beliefs in whoever I can plug into it today out there. So, Futurist is one of the most unpopular skills in the world today, particularly in this part. Futurism is really about prescience, the ability of the human spirit to um, gain clarity about what is ahead and doing so today. Pretty much declaring the end from the beginning, right? In the corporate world, they'll be more comfortable with strategic foresighting. So you find that a lot of people, corporate Africa essentially drives all of what they know with strategic thinking. And people pride themselves in strategic thinking. Except that strategic thinking should be preceded by strategic foresight. Because the idea is someone paints a picture of the future for you and that you make decisions today based on what you see in the future, as opposed to um, the short-term thinking of, you know, um, trying to articulate the future of a product or the future of an idea or a philosophy or a service or a market or an industry, right? So essentially what futurists do is to predict the future of anything. Um, trend watching, a lot of trend watching, a lot of um, that, then comes to what is called prescience, uh, which you then are able to sit in the future and be able to see what is going on in the future and make predictions based on that today so that people can govern behavior, govern thinking, govern decisions by um, that clearly, right? So 
there's the future of computers, there's the future of um, um, an idea, there's the future of an industry, the future of the church, the future of religion, the future of real estate, oil, the future of everything, you know. Um, but in America and most first world countries, future is a big deal, you know, uh, because Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100 companies, some of the, the biggest corporations in the world, we always have a futurist in the room so that it can help them to tell the future of whatever it is they pride themselves in today. The idea is you don't want to be so loyal to what is working and forget it's going to change. I mean, talk to Kodak, right? Talk to Yahoo, talk to Nokia, yeah. you know. So you want to be ahead of yourself, pretty much um, determining the aspiring of the excellence that you know today and to be able to build something um, more powerful that determines the next level of that thing. That is what future is to. That's it. It's time travel, actually. So, research, and like Kenneth showing you research and ideas, LCs. Yes. It, it's. I'm a typical Nigerian. Yes. I live here. I, I work here. You know, I've been here all my life. Ideas and research. In the typical Nigerian um, context, I believe that there's this there's this anti-intellectualism. There's this thing that you know ideas. When when you talk about ideas, they see you as they say you speak grammar, you know, it's, yeah. you know. But you 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 built a humongous business on ideas and research. Yeah. Where did it all start? How and how has it been interacting with? the core people who actually need those ideas. Because I think the, one of the key gaps we have is, is knowledge and ideas. There's a knowledge gap. There's, there's, there's one huge gulf of ideas. In the, and, and it's manifest in the way we, we, we react as opposed to act. Yes. It's a manifest in the way we, we respond as opposed to plan. Yes. And, and it's, it is so culturally ingrained that mm. I don't know if it's a sign of a people who have given up hope, but there was something you said in a random conversation. You said, if a hope is not a strategy. It's not. Right? It's not. And I've been thinking about it, and, I've, you know, and I'm saying, okay, so hope, so this is my, 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 my theory. This is what I've, I've made out of that, that statement. That hope is engine oil. Yes. Faith is fuel. Mm. But without an engine and a steering, mm. without a strategy, without a plan yes. and a direction, yes. fuel and engine oil is great, but the vehicle yeah. is not going Correct. to go anywhere. Correct. Correct. So, in a nutshell, uh, ideas, research, your journey, and the people, and, and what? How did that? How did you get to a point where you're thinking I could make something? structured something enduring out of ideation, idea yes. generation. Yes. I, I, I think it, a part of it is existential for me. Um, I think it's my destiny to think inside out, you know, or this and that. But I will be lying if I do that. And, and I will be betraying the truth of my conscience. Because the truth is a lot of the propensity to want to um, understand, to want to search, query. Um, when I was much younger and immature, it was represented with a lot of rebellion. It was just difficult for me to sit in the status quo. It was just difficult for me to accept something just because somebody said it. Um, it was difficult for me to accept that because somebody is older than me, automatically I have to defer to his thinking. You know, I, when I know that there's a 62 year old security guard and there's a 20 something year old billionaire, you know, time here, best certificate definitely has not helped this gentleman, you know. <laughs> so I've always been a rebel. I grew up in a polygamous home. Um, and you know, the forces of a polygamous home are very you know, interesting, you know. In a, in a polygamous home with, with you know, m more than one wife, you, you learn to. Um, no, it's okay. okay, that's my time. Yeah. I forgot that. <laughs> you learn to um, compete before you know the meaning of competition. Yeah. 
pretty much um because you have other kids from other moms oh, man, and everybody's fighting for the heart and the pocket of the father and so you have to do well in heart school you have to do all of that yeah and that's tough you know um as a child that's too much for you your mom wants you to be first in class not because of the ideal of success but because if you are first in class it represents value to your dad who releases resources in the direction of your mom so he, as a child that's heavy because what you have been taught is to pursue the loftiest things in life for the wrong reasons yeah. by the time you become an adult you practically become incapable of pursuing things for the for the essence of it for the meaning and the purpose of it you, you just find yourself pursuing things for the wrong reasons you know you, you grew up in a polygamous home your mom is going out she cannot she would rather leave you with friends in neighbors 10 houses away and leave you with people in the same house who with your siblings, your brothers, your last sisters, name, you know, yeah. who your dad says are your siblings, and your mom says they are your adversary, and their mom says the same thing. You know, as a child, that is too much for you to imagine that your adversaries are people you have to be in the same space, bear the same name, you know. And by the time you become an adult, you practically become incapable of trusting anyone. Because you couldn't even trust the people you sleep in the same room with, you know. So I grew up with all of that complexity. It forced me to go inside of myself a lot. I was in a boarding house at the age of three. Whoa. You know, um, not out of the country, but here in, in Lagos. My son um, is 10. I can't imagine living him in a boarding house right now. To be in a boarding house at the age of three is, is torturous, you know. But I don't judge my folks for doing that. You know, my mom did that as an investment in my sanity because the home, whatever complexity I would face in the boarding house, the home front was worse. So it made sense that I choose that lesser evil. You know, so um, I've had to navigate by myself. And I have, I've had to, I was in, at past common entrance at the age of four. I was in secondary school in 1980, 1980 at the age of nine in Form 1. In 1980, um, secondary school players were playing in the Green Eagles. People like Stephen Keshi, Henry Wosu were secondary school players. You know, um, my senior prefect in secondary school drove a ladder. I don't remember oh, that ladder. car, yeah, yeah. a ladder, yeah. LAD. LAD. He, he, he drove that in school. He had that in secondary school and he had a dog. In the boarding house. <laughs> so these are big boys. Big boys. Puberty oh, signs, all of them. You are just nine. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. You, I, I, I was so out of place. How did that allow you? You know. Into, you yeah. know well, at, at that time, I think foolishly, parents pride themselves in, you know, the genius of a child to appear in adult spaces. You know, so it was kind of remarkable that at age four, you had part com at primary four, you part come and entrance, yeah. you skipped primary five and six, six yeah. and jumped into yeah. secondary school. I was the star everywhere in the neighborhood so academically, and everything. You're, 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 the kid is capable of, uh, academically, actually. Yes. yes. But socially yeah. and otherwise, yes. you know, psychologically, you're not there. You, 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 it, it will take another type of intervention yeah. for you to be there. So um, I think that's where a lot of my curiosity, my sense of curiosity was pretty much new. I meant to... Three minutes, and I just, I know, say so you know, go past me. In, in three minutes, I just know, say so you know. <laughs> Yeah, so that's it for me. I then grown out of that. Of course, you know, I went left a, lo a lot. Um, I went left um, for the most part of my youth. Um, when I say left, I mean the left side of life, drugs, boys, parties, violence, cults. I was there. I spent 12 years in the university studying a four-year course. 12 years, one university, you know. At the end of 12 years, you should have a BSc, you should have a master's. two masters and a PhD. And a PhD yeah. But I ended up with a BSc and it was, it was top class, but it was a miracle. Wow. You know, I was very proud of it because the option was not to have any. The journey of knowledge ahead of me required that I have a university degree as, as baseline, just so that society can recognize me, not because I need it personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because there is a sense in which your determination is irrelevant if society cannot interpret you. Okay. So you need a degree at times, not because of the contents of the degree, 
but because of the value society has placed on it or the premium society has placed on it such that you make yourself invisible if you reject it so i fought for it with every power in me to make sure i'm i was a graduate and did that coincide with the times uh, last was closed for like two years or yes like yes year? yes i mean that was part of it but even if last was not closed i mean by the time i was in my phone at the end of my first semester i had eight carryovers <laughs> by the time i was finishing year one i had about 15 carryovers by the time i was in could, could, could have you tried to, to fact check you know if, if you were if you were eligible for the guinness, guinness world record <laughs> <laughs> maybe i mean um by the time i was i began to understand what life meant and connected with my spirit and i had accepted god in my life i felt it was necessary at the point in my life i'd gotten to my wit's end and at that time you know, I was already very clear that a lot of what is available in the world, you know, are essentially outside of the human spirit. And if you allow them to govern you, because that's not designed, they limit you. That life cannot be outside in, no matter what is outside, life has to be inside out. That was the clarity that disconnected me from a lot of what is outside of me and began to regulate my thinking and my behavior inside out. So research, um, fact finding has been, has just been there. Um, I, I have a program I call Creative Rebellion because rebellion made me, you know, um, questioning everything. Um, why must this be? I mean, I've asked, asked God some of the most complex questions in the world. Where did you come from? I've answered it. Um, why didn't you kill the devil? What is my business with the devil? I wasn't in the Garden of Eden. I've answered it. If, if there, was only, there were only two people in the Garden of Eden and you couldn't manage them, how are you going to manage seven billion people? You know, I've answered those questions. questions. You know, um, I had to answer those questions so that why faith can work for me. You look at the poorest countries in the world. The poorest countries in the world invest the least on research and development. The most prosperous countries in the world research the, um, invest yes, yes. the highest on research and development. The same thing goes for the, the, the most prosperous businesses in the world. These are facts. Um, it goes for the, the most prosperous individuals, the most prosperous families. But what makes it impossible, similarly impossible for leadership, political leadership, in particular in Africa, to learn this very simple, basic thing, is it? That absence of strategic thinking is it the absence of futurism what how can a bunch of us sit down around the table and see s examples of this type of scenario happen time and again and again and they still decide for some other reason to say let's persecute this idea or this this concept or this set yes. of people or yes. this nation yeah i i think is uh, prejudiced by hubris um the human the human species it's the human condition is essentially you know pummeled by um a type of hubris that deceives him to think that what he knows defines all that can be known and what that does is it gives you it's the same reason why you see somebody say i don't want to marry an Igbo man why don't you want to marry an Igbo man? They say, well, when if you, if he dies, your entire family is in crisis. So I don't want to marry a Yoruba man. Why? I think they are stingy. An Ijebu man. I don't want to marry. You know, because arm robbers wear trainers doesn't mean everybody wearing trainers is an arm robber. The prejudice that's come from the weight of your own experience, or from your own pain, or for whatever you are trying to avoid in life, becomes your you know, um, basis for interpreting the world, you know. So I think you, if we expand what the question, if we ask, you then see the idea that there's no prosperous black nation in the world. There's no society that is predominantly black that is prosperous. There's not one. Every society that is predominantly black is, 
is suffering socioeconomically, politically, you know. So th those are questions to ask, you know. Um, so I, I, I've concluded that there is, there, is, there is a sad premium on ownership. And, and this is very important that we understand it. The idea that you own things is very deep in Africa. It's part of our culture, actually. What do you think uh, the owner... No, no, I'm going somewhere with that. So, and it is normal and almost right to consider the law does not punish you to celebrate ownership of private property, right? Nobody is against you for ownership of private property. Except that when you spend 40 years of your life on that philosophical or ideological part of ownership of private property, which is right and legal, the more you spend on that part, the more incapable of sitting in a public office you become, whether as a pastor or as a imam or as a CEO or president or governor, or mayor or whatever. Because by design, stewardship of private property should precede stewardship of public property. When people have spent 35 years of their life mastering the legal idea of ownership of private property, what they mastered there is ownership, ownership thinking. When they get into the public space, they will sincerely try to provide stewardship. Inability to let go. Except that people are sincerely in prison, people are sincerely poor, people are sincerely frustrated. Sincerity is not a factor of production. It transcends your sincerity. Because you have to have mastered what we play out. And what they have mastered is ownership. So when they get into the public domain, they're going to find themselves supplying that same thinking of ownership of public property. Wow. Now, the, the, the sacrifice of practicing stewardship of private property is founded on the idea that you are a custodian of whatever it is has come to you, that you don't own anything, and that whatever you own belongs to the world and belongs to the universe. But that if you are a pipe, you are a conduit that passes out water to those who are thirsty, even without any vision to be wet, without any faith or commitment to be wet, the residue of what you pass out will remain in you. Because if you water, you be you also be wet. It, and if you water, you'll be watered because there's water you are passing out. So if your goal is to be a steward of for the universe and everything that comes into your life, you hold it in as a custodian of it. A residue of that will remain in your life. So they'll call you a millionaire. They'll call you a billionaire, right? But you are serving the world. I call it personal social responsibility. You are serving the world with all of your genius, with all of your power, with all of your resources, with all of your energy. If you master that privately, what you have mastered is stewardship. If we then put you in a public domain, you really don't have a choice. Your default is stewardship. So because you have mastered stewardship of private property, which is a sacrifice, it is easier then to supply stewardship of public property. The person who, who is yet to master stewardship of private property cannot supply stewardship of public property, even if he's determined to do so. He will make promises to himself, he will break as many as he has made, and he will do so sincerely. Because what is wrong is completely away from his reality. You say that uh, when people go in a public space and they can be comfortable in every way being dating and saying it's not my house, if we will tell you that you are dating your house, yeah. just that we are not in your bedroom to see you, you can't be neat inside and come out and be dirty and yeah. be okay with filth. The, the idea in that, as a matter of fact, is that physically it can actually be very clean in his house. But your house is actually not your space. Your, your physical space is your environment. Your environment is where we should audit. And, and that is not outside in. That's inside out. And there is a sense in which you can um, 
permit disorder, you know, can tolerate, can tolerate disorder, yeah. disorder. And the idea that there's no disorder in your life, in your own house, is the therapy that you need to hide from your filth that exists in your thinking, in your character. We don't audit the strength of a man's character. We audit the, the garment that shields that. A lot of people are incapable of honest self-evaluation. They hide their helplessness behind that of others. So when people talk like that, what they're actually doing is hiding behind the imbalance of the society. There's something much more deeper inside of them that allows them to tolerate that, you know. I'm asking myself, what kind of people would we have been mm. to have coexisted in these communities within this kind of... We're not coexisting in China, we're mm. not in Russia, we're mm. not in Australia, we're mm. not in this vast, you know, mm. uh, uh, countries where, you know, you could actually even really place one person, you know, per kilometer yes. square and there's still the space left. How could we coexist in this really supposedly close-knit uh, 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 societies and still focus on those dialectual differences that makes it impossible for the next person to understand what we're trying to say. Uh, so, so that is what I think that pigeon can do. Because if you insist on the technicality of English, it means that if I want to apply for a job, maybe as a receptionist, and I say, what's your name? My, my name is Ole Shoreo. Um, so where are you from? I'm, I'm, I'm come from, you know, and then you disqualified me based on the defects of grammar, yeah. right? What you are doing unknown to you is that you forgot that you have not made room for everybody, for 200 million people to master that English. There are guys who have been watching Spider-Man from their womb, who by virtue of birth have an advantage over you automatically because of who their parents are, because of how exposed they are, how their parents have been traveling long before they were conceived. They were probably born abroad and then they came back to Nigeria. They went to a great school, maybe some Corona or some amazing school, right? And then you have millions more, tens of millions more who did not have that privilege. So when you raise, the, raise that bar, what you're actually doing is creating a standard of separating the haves from the have not. There's another layer. So another English extent. language, actually, we, if we go to the history, as at 1940-something, in the 50s, in the 40s, in the 30s, if you can speak English at any level, you are a nationalist of some sort. Just because you can speak English, you are even if you have no degree, you have no other education apart from the ability to speak English. Mm -hmm. You are a nationalist. First of all, you are the one talking to the white man. You are his interpreter. You are the court clerk. Mm -hmm. You are the one with the big jobs. You are the one working with the white man. You are but the one cool. with and all the can, room. And you can end up just interpreting. You know, interpreting and you are a big boy. You know. <laughs> so, imagine that. So, English language was a determinant of progress at that time. And that legacy is what we have carried on into a post-independence world where English language continue to be a determinant of progress, regardless of how many people cannot speak it. What is interesting, though, to the question is that everybody can speak pidgin. Everyone can speak a form of it, no matter how grammatically wrong it is. So everybody can come. If you throw any Nigerian anywhere in this country with pidgin, he will negotiate, he will buy in any market, he will do whatever he needs to do and he will walk away. So it is too late to cancel English language. 60 years of accepting a system is almost impossible to delete. Yeah. I agree. But we can reduce its power as a determinant of yes, progress side in side. our country. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, we can have Chinese scientists, Russian scientists, engineering, do you understand? engineering is not English language or whatever. Do you understand? So I think we can do that. It's and I think, right yeah. And if we allow people to come into that and get away from that limitation. Yeah. There's so much genius we're going to experience. Yes, I have, I have, I have uh, not even to speak English. So th there, there was even a scenario where uh, we're having this engagement somewhere. We're having fun. And somebody was insisting that, you know, you know, but but uh, uh, okay, after all they said and why 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 does this why does it have to speak so much pigeon, you know? Why did they speak so much pigeon? I was talking about two things. So Beanie Man was here, right? 
Um, what did he speak? He said he spoke in Jamaican Patois. <laughs> um, 50 Cent was here, uh, Wycliffe was here. What did he speak? Um, he spoke, you know, uh, Ebonics, you know, US. Mm. So why is it okay for 50 Cent to speak in Ebonics? Which is to, to a standard American English because it's, it's incoherent, mm -hmm. yes. ungrammatical. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. In short, it's not just okay, it's stylish. It's cool. It's, it's something you, you should even admire and even emulate. Yes. Later, <laughs> you know, when, when Vinny Man says, Wagwan, you know, uh, me, I just, me, I just show, mm. you know, and it's fine. It's funky. And the two face says, oh boy, yeah, just you show here, yeah, you know, nothing that happened. And you think uh, he's, he's, uh, he's been a, an educator, he's been <laughs> crass, he's been classless. But and once we, we said, once we had that conversation, they started looking at it from that periscope. Then it, it became, you know, clear that uh, this was a position that was founded in, in a lot of ignorance, yes. a lot of, you know, whatever. Yeah. So uh, prejudice. Prejudice. This man of prejudice. The word. Okay. So um, two more quick responses. Um, organized religion. As a futurist, mm. what are your thoughts on organized religion from the perspective of the future? I, I, I don't think organized religion has a future. In fact, I don't think religion has a future. Worldwide, anyway. situated. Worldwide. Okay. Religion does not have a future. Religion cannot survive the... As a matter of fact, I predict that religion will not survive Gen Z. The freedom that Gen Z is uh, insisting on is, is freedom without rules, which is a vice, actually. Because freedom without rules is like politics without principle. Yeah. So freedom, with freedom, must be must be Temple. guided by, or must be subject to reasoning, and reasoning itself must be guided by truth. The same thing with emotions. The same thing with feelings. Feelings must be subjected to reasoning, and reasoning must be guided by truth before you go to action. Most definitely, most people move from emotion to action. From freedom to action, all of these components expensive must be location. expensive, must be subjected to reasoning. Reasoning itself, a lot of advocacy. You know, people say, for example, I know someone who is in the forefront of fighting world peace, but she knows no peace herself. <laughs> you see, people say end rape. You, you really have to be clear sharp on what the goal is so that you can have the right impulse to achieving it because you can't end rape. The only way to end rape is to first of all, end evil. And the only way to end evil is to kill the devil. And that's not going to happen. So a rapist we always have, right? Um, it's, it's like saying end poverty. You can't end poverty. The poor you always have. These are not things that are created. A part of poverty is created, but a part of it is not created. It's very personal, right? Is, is, is something that is the architecture of a being. <laughs> Do you understand? So, um, maybe you say, let's alleviate poverty. Let's control it. That makes sense. You know. Um, so, you want to control the entire evil that guides rape. You know. I've heard people say, you are a girl. You don't, it doesn't matter what you wear. The rapist should not rape you. Even if you strip yourself naked, it should control himself. Really? Okay, let's agree to that. Then why do you have a fence in your house? <laughs> you have a right not to be robbed. Yeah. You have a right to property. Because you say, I have a right to property, nobody should rob me. Therefore, I should leave my fence open. I should not have any gates. I should not have any alarm. I should not have any security. My right to security, to life and security is enough to protect me. Yeah. But you don't do that. You erect a big fence to support your house. And you are telling a young girl who cannot pr protect herself to just dress anyhow and come out anyhow. That is not trying to put the blame on the girl. That is saying foolishness is a constant. Mm -hmm. You will not be punished because of the foolishness of others. So erect your own protocol and create your own wall so that no fool has access to you because he cannot control but himself. It's now a violation it's not of, your, of, your, of your space. Of your you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so, so that is by the side. But the idea is that the freedom of Gen Z, we question everything. But it's not just freedom. They are also insisting on transparency. They are insisting on accountability. And if you watch the religious space since 2017, 
the Christians are facing a lot of backlash. And it's been like brilliant ever like ever before. Everything is being questioned. Um, apart from the fact that every 500 years, everything called religion is destructed. And it, it doesn't just stop in the faith circle. It goes into society to shape culture. The last one was the 1517 Reformation by Martin Luther, which ended in 2017. It means 500 years began to count from 2017. So organized religion we bust in its seams because it thrives on secrecy, it thrives on regimentation, it thrives on um, unproductive order, right? And so those things can survive the curiosity, you know, um, of an entire generation. Um, but spirituality will expand and faith will grow. But religion, as we know it, will be terribly cracked. So I will not say that you will not have churches again or you will not have mosques again, but people will now see church, see religion as a useful addition to what they understand. So when people come to church, for example, church will be about coming to give as opposed to coming to take, you see? And that will be a different way of experiencing God. And I can speak especially for the Christian faith. What we know as religion and order of worship in the church today, I kid you not, if it survives in next, by 2030, by December 31st night, if it survives it, I tell you for free, it cannot survive 2050. God will not die, the devil will not die, but our perception of that association is going to be upgraded into a format unprecedented. So spirituality is going to continue to grow, faith will be expanded, but religion, has, because religion is not God, no. it's a human attempt to no, capture God. Yeah. Religion, religion is a human effort to capture God. God is bigger than religion as we know it, right? And it has become necessary that we begin to um, make the distinction between religion as popular as it is and the, the borderlessness of spirituality and faith, right? And that is more important for me. And as a Christian, you know, I'm, I'm excited about those years, you know, because I think that is when we come into the real intent and the borderlessness of having a residual experience of god inside of you you know yeah so it's a symposium discussion it's, but, it is it is but, uh, but that's what i, I think. <laughs> okay so I, I, it, please yeah, yes I, I would i would take one more uh, perspective before we go to recall briefly. okay then we wrap up with truth of poison i, I promised i was going to keep you much longer than an hour i think we've done that already. i can extend if you want yeah This is where we've, we've switched to recall. Uh, we'd like to hear a profound or outrageous experience uh, in the course of, of your work, in the course of your life. Yeah, I'll share a sober one. Yeah. Um, many years ago in the boarding house, I told you how young I was in the boarding house. So I had a school father who kept the keys to his locker with me. And in his locker were provisions, milk, um, beverages, biscuits, and he knows all about that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I didn't have. I keep the keys. Some smart guy began to steal from the, the locker, and but the keys, the padlock was not broken, and, and the keys were with me. And this guy is wondering, ah, Bonvita is gone, milk is gone. Tomorrow, cabin biscuit is gone. It's, ah, so he said, who is taking this thing? I said, but nobody has broken into the locker. You have the key. So how is this thing possible? You possible. Should have, you should have known better. It was there years ahead of <laughs> You know, he let me go for about three, four days. The one day he called me. So you are very smart, right? You you are the best in your class. I know you are very smart. You pass command entrance at the age of four. You are, you are, you know. So you actually, I know you are a genius. And then you are an evil genius. <laughs> you keep the keys. You open the padlock. You eat these things because you have. You believe I will not believe 
that you'll be <laughs> doing such effrontery. <laughs> that you believe that I can't think that I'll be doing that to, to my face. So you want me to surrender to some type of mystery? No, you are the thief. You are the one with the key. The padlock is not broken. Nothing is broken and things are getting missing. You are the one eating it. Took me out. And you know the body else. They beat the living daylight out of me. Stripped me naked. Dragged me in the mid school to the school square, pretty much. They were singing for me, you know. It is a song we sing about your private part that they were singing the song, Oku you know, yeah. it was terrible. Oh, wow. Whatever I had left, first of all, I lost a lot of my confidence joining through a boarding house at the age of three. I lost a lot of confidence being the youngest everywhere in the school with people with puberty inside. And when you go into the, into the bathroom to have your shower in the morning, you see big boys with muscle and big, big part, you know, and you are just tiny there, you know, you just, you know, I've, I've been defeated by those experiences. Whatever I had left as esteem was withdrawn and taken away finally in that moment. It took me, took me a very long time to be able to say hello to a girl. In fact, I never dated, you know, before I came to myself, I was a lot of girls. But the rule for me to be with a girl is that you must have a boyfriend. If you don't have a boyfriend, I can't, can't have anything together. So. Because it's really, whatever it, all of the protocol of wooing a girl, I don't, okay. there's, not that there's even no time, I don't even have the confidence. So most of the girls that I dated are people who I, who just came around me, found my weirdness okay. interesting, and probably started showing me light that was too clear, I should take, I should make a move here, you know, pretty much. The first girl that I really love in my life, who did not, you know, um, who I, I, I chased, you know, boldly and confidently, and who I really loved, and who didn't have to be dating somebody first, was my wife. Oh, wow. You know, I was with so many oh, girls. People so don't even wife. believe it, because I was with so many girls. You know, but to imagine that none of them, you know, um, all of them had to have a relationship, first of all, as a precondition. You know, but the idea was, I was so messed up, that till today, on many levels, I still struggle with that experience. I'm not completely free from it, because it took a lot for me. You know, but, um, so that happened. At the end of the term, we all have to move to another room and change and move our lockers. So when we were moving to this room at the end of the term, they pulled the locker, we went to carry the locker, and the back and of the locker just went boom, because the locker was on a wall, apparently. Yeah. So what this genius of a thief had done mm -hmm. was to lose it from the back. It was a common skill there, yeah. but at that oh. time, that guy was the pioneer. I'm a bit surprised that your, your so-called school father didn't know. Mm, at that, Most at of these things we met in school that we do, we met them. Yes, but at that time, he was one of the earliest pioneers mm -hmm. of that idea. He was still, well, he, he was, he had, yes, he hadn't gone viral. It, it had not gone viral at that time in our, in our own body now. So, as we moved, the back wow. just went, oh, and we saw it. Oh, he, go, he just got the idea. He apologized to me, but as he was apologizing, Please. between you and I, if I had a knife, oh, I would stab him a million times yeah. in that yeah. moment. Yeah. I was ready to kill. for the, That was my first, the very first time because I know the, f the, the, the energy of the propensity to want to kill. I know that feeling because I had it that day yeah. for the first. I felt like killing him. If I had a choice, I would have killed him before I realized what I, what I had done. Yes. I was ready to do it. Because I thought to myself, you're apologizing. Are you going to rewind all of what the happened? Trauma. The trauma. Are you, are you going to change all of that? Yeah. You couldn't believe me. So I made up my mind that day that facts will never capture the weight of truth because everything nailed me that i was a thief but i wasn't a thief another thing before we go is that our world must learn and for the audience you know we must know the difference between intelligence and wisdom because it takes a lot of intelligence to rob a bank successfully project management scenario planning goal setting planning if you know how to plan, you can plan to rob a bank or to sleep with my wife. You know, skills have their name sense value. Um, wisdom can destroy, intelligence can destroy the world. A lot of intelligence made be Ladin. 9-11 was an intelligent work. Very, very intelligence can create good, but it can also create the highest level of lethality. 
But wisdom only creates good. Wisdom cannot destroy. We need to graduate and begin to search for wisdom in people and not just intelligence. You know. I came to what you said about justice and peace. Justice yes. and peace. Yes. It's just part of what we are saying. The idea that you really cannot define your justice as the ultimate drive of your balance as a human being. <clears throat> the articulation for justice is always possible. But every time you fight for your justice, you trade your peace for it. Because peace is superior to justice. And you cannot um, premium justice over peace and not create a crack in your life. The person that can supply perfect behavior has never been born, will never be born. If you insist on the standards of perfect behavior for you to have peace, you will never have it. If you hold yourself to that standard, you'll be miserable. If you hold others, your employers, your employees, your friends, your family members, your wife or your husband, to the standard of perfect behavior, you will never have peace. Peace is created in spite of perfect be imperfect behavior. We get to um, truth or poison. Yes. Uh, so what do we have? What, 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 brew, what mixture do we have uh, today? <laughs> Peter leaf and vinegar. <laughs> My God, I'm not going to taste anything. <laughs> There's no lime today. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> okay. So we, we, maybe we have a, a minute or two before the brew is ready before we ask the question. Uh, so <laughs> permit me to um, to get one one, one more uh, feedback from from from. Um, one, one of your presentations I watched uh, about the mediocrity of the system. You give, you, you shared this, this, this scenario of, of a pothole of guys. You said you, you engage with some young men and they yes. said that, you know, they did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I went to speak somewhere. <laughs> and when I was done, I had time to um, listen to the audience and just talk to them one on one. I like to do that a lot. Just feel the people um, getting closer, take pictures, um, say a few words, prophesy, give counsel here and there. So there's this group of boys who came, and all they wanted was money, you know. And I did give them because I give to anyone that asks of me if I have. Um, I think begging in itself must be understood as the defeat of the human experience. If anybody begs, it's already a proof of their defeat, you know, and you shouldn't rub it in so that you have or don't yeah, have. Yeah. So I gave, and then I gathered them to say, so what do you guys do? I was just trying to offer counsel. So what do you guys do? Uh, they said, oh, what we do? We, we, we dig portals. I said, ah, you dig portals? What does that mean? How? He said, yeah, we dig portals. We go to the road and we are digging portals. Ah, so who pays you for that? Check this out. Who, who pays you for digging portals? Yeah, you know, the people, all these vendors, association, people who sell hawk, they have association. They pay us to dig the road because when, to, to, because when we dig, when we create portals, there's traffic. And when there's traffic, they can sell recharge cards, they sell newspapers, there's a lot of sales. So bad road is a, bad road is a, is a tool for you know um for sales Welcome. you know so we must to keep the business going there must be bad roads are you sure politicians you know. local government chairman <laughs> probably so so so, so, <laughs> so so i said so so what have they said no matter how much they cover it we'll go and dig it again they pay us to dig it that is what we do we dig roads we dig potholes everywhere you know so it's not so even if you have the best road and no car is on it it's, it's not it's not just trucks that are creating the yeah. portals is a human problem. And any gap in the system that thrives on the genuine, you know, um, lack of character of the people within that system, that is no longer a problem. You know, that is a disease yeah. that needs to be attended to. People are sick, you know. So when people profit from the mediocrity of the system, you know, um, it it's just like the same thing we think about when we think of power. 
People say we need social mega ads and we have 24 hour power supply, but no, that's not the problem. That's not the problem. It is that people feed on the mediocrity of the system. The people who import generator, big gen, the people who import small gen, the people who import spare part of big gen, the people who import spare part of small gen, the people who repair big gen, the people who repair small gen, those who sell diesel uh, to the gen, those who sell f fuel to the gen, the people who sell lantern, um, candle, rechargeable matches, rechargeable lamps, batteries, and all of that. What, how are you going to deal with all of those people? You, you actually want them to sit down and you just have 24 power su su supply. What happened to all these people? Apart from the fact that you are the one that said entrepreneurs should solve problems. They should see problems and solve it. Yes, and for, o for over 60 years, you refuse to give yourself 24 power supply since your power, power machines are HIV positive. Mm -hmm. So they can't be healed. So <laughs> these guys came into the picture to solve a problem. Yeah. You can't punish them for doing so. If you now decide to solve that problem. You have to, first of all, thank these people for their faithfulness over the years for solving that problem for stepping you, in the gap. for stepping in the gap. <laughs> what you then want to do is to realize that an entire industry, families are feeding from here, and entire skills are trapped inside this place. So if you want to move to, say, solar or renewable energy, you have to, first of all, think of how do we transfer all the skills here into this new economy that we want to build. Number two is, how do we keep these guys flowing? Because Mikano, John Holt, um, <laughs> Jubaili would rather give would rather give Nepal one billion every year or ten billion to say sabotage whatever the effort is, you know. So why don't you go do the research for the solar or the renewable energy you want to create, and say, guys, this is the business model for thriving in this new economy. You can diversify yeah. in seven years. If you diversify in seven years, these are the tax holidays you get or the tax rebates or tax cuts that you get for moving. So you incentivize that path and that journey. And then you think of the skills that are trapped in the old economy and how to move them here. That's nation building. That's statesmanship. That's how we have to think. But everyone that comes on your came for eight years, they want to solve the problem. He neglected that because he's solving a problem. Not, it's not curing a disease. The same thing with the guys who dig the portal. Bad road is not going to be fixed just by having good roads. You have the best road with no car on it. These guys will come and dig it because they need traffic. You know. So when people profit from the mediocrity of the system, you know, the type of care and attention it requires transcends, you know, the technicality of problem solving. Thank you very much. And we do hope that we can have the kind of leadership that's forward thinking. We hope so. That um sticks you know, looks at this problem from a you know, a bird's eye view. Uh, vantage position and, and takes into consideration all the dynamics so we can have quality you know, and enduring uh, solutions. I'm not taking this. Mm, uh, so, yes, yeah, so <laughs> the only way to do that is just answer the question. Okay. So, so take your first pick, your first guy, run in the middle. Three. Three. Client A, well meaning, low budget. Client B, big budget, but with a history of unseriousness. Your shadow can only accommodate one. Which would you accept? Um, so I will, I will, I will accept the second guy who has a, who has, who has capacity, and is unserious. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Next question. I told you guys. <laughs> Pick it without drinking. <laughs> Number one. There's an important opening for a creative, but you can only plug one. Kobams, Tsubaba, Alibaba. Kobams. For a creative, no, Alibaba. Which one? <laughs> Which Baba? Two, two already. Which of the Baba? Alibaba. Alibaba. Okay. Okay. <laughs> for a creative, okay. I'll go for Alibaba. Last, uh, last, I, this, I, I told you guys this question. Four. Question number four. Here it comes. All three are in Dallas on different speaking events, and you can only attend one. JJ Omojua, Chimamada Adichi, Feladro Rotoy. JJ Omojua. Easy peasy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll always take my questions. I told you, no problem. No problem. <laughs> 
I'm not taking this poison. He asked me a big old question. I'm not afraid to ask. Uh, to answer. Uh, today I case, you're come and drink the poison. <laughs> Take it for your team for bringing questions that will allow my guests not drink poison. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, PK. You guys respect You're me most now. welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Every human being is born with the, with the potential for greatness. We must know the difference between intelligence and wisdom. Because it takes a lot of intelligence to rob a bank successfully project management, scenario planning, goal setting, planning. If you know how to plan, you can plan to rob a bank or to sleep with my wife. You know, skills have their name sense value. Um, wisdom can destroy, intelligence can destroy the world. A lot of intelligence made Biladin. 9-11 was an intelligent work. Intelligence can create good, but it can also create the highest level of lethality. But wisdom only creates good. Wisdom cannot destroy. We need to graduate and begin to search for wisdom in people and not just intelligence. <laughs> I'll always take my questions. I told you, no <laughs> I'm not taking this poison. I wish that when we are done with the questions, we can now be asked why we took the decision. Why did I decide? For the other guy, why did yes, I decide yeah. for this? Why did I decide for this? Yeah. Because the reason why I would take Omojua is not necessarily because I would find Fela uninteresting.